because I am recording it on a evening. Uh, this is the start of lecture 4 which would be divided into 2 classes. Our focus would remain on finite dimensional vector spaces because that is what we require ultimately and in applications especially for economic students this is what is uh, important. It is even important in mathematics it does not it, 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 that is the main workhorse actually finite dimensional vector spaces. So, the notion of a dimension would become a thing of crucial discussion here because here we want to give a very formal and very what would you say a very effective or very rigorous definition of dimension. Dimension this notion had always remained very uh, you know very critically it, 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 it has always remained very geometrical very intuitive to me you I and you can know what the dimension means because we also are embedded in three dimension we have three dimensional objects ourselves. So, we can uh, assume pretty well that uh, that we are uh, I am assuming the whole human body inside is filled there is no gap uh, <laughs> then of course, we are sitting in three dimension and being ourselves three dimensional. So, is there any way to provide a definition those who have had any study of linear algebra before because this is a graduate class so on in undergraduate level if you have studied in linear algebra. So, they talk about the basis of a vector space and the number of elements of a basis is they say it is defined as the dimension of the vector space, but that definition has come actually by uh, looking at the basic geometrical intuition that we get from R 2 or R 3, because uh, this is it should be leave L i V not leave. So, we are in R 3 the piece of paper on which I wrote the note which is scanned up here is in R 2 or more precisely we are in R 4 in space time. And let us look at the whole things R 2 has points given by 2 real numbers R n R 3 has points given by 3 real numbers and their dimensions are accordingly. So, R n you can intuitively say that the dimension is n actually this we will see that it has got really got to do with the number of independent directions or linearly independent directions which can span this space. So, it is a good idea sometimes in mathematics that you progress with the feeling of an intuitive understanding of stuff and gradually gradually you get a more rigorous understanding. No idea in mathematics has just come out very rigorously and somebody got up in the morning and wrote down something nice and everything was rigorous from the very beginning. No, it never happened like that. It is a subject which is built on imagination on, on in intuition which are largely geometrical especially subjects like this. So, it we have to admit the move from an intuitive viewpoint to a more rigorous viewpoint that is the way I would like to think about mathematics. So, what we have seen that there are the several types of vector spaces in finite dimension which may not immediately look like R n, but actually you can show at the end that all finite dimensional vector spaces of say n dimensions would look like R n. So, what about other vector spaces how do I know their dimension this R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4, R n this is geometric and very intuitive. How to know about their dimensions is there any algebraic way to speak about them and can we fix up a formal definition that is the key. Uh, the key effort in this class. Okay. So, let us start with an example of a real vector space the space m 2 of all 2 cross 2 real matrices. So, they form a vector space under the vector addition here mean the matrix addition and the scalar multiplication being the standard scalar multiplication of a matrix. So, what is the dimension of m 2? it is not immediately apparent, 
but you can do something you can see that if I take the first column and then st stack the lower column below it. So, then I will form a vector A C B D. This operation of forming a vector from the 2 cross 2 matrix is given by this VEC operation V E C and VEC of A B C D is a the vector A C B D which is in R 4 and R 4 has dimension 4. So, our intuition immediately tells us yeah we might quite confidently say that M 2 has dimension 4 and later on we will see that in through even when we go through the formal definition M 2 does have dimension 4. What about the space S 2 of 2 cross 2 symmetric matrices where a the this position of B and this position of C the non diagonal off diagonal elements are equal right. So, instead of writing A B C D with B equal to C it we can write it as A B B D. So, what would be the you can say of course, it is again a vector space when is it a, you know, a, a, a again a part of R 4 because every uh, element here can be written as A B B D. So, basically we essentially needing 3 real numbers to generate it, you do not need 4 real numbers here, but it is definitely a part of R 4 a subset of R 4. So, but is the dimension of that set because there are 2 numbers which are equal same as for example, the x y same as m 2 for example, the take the x y plane in R 3 the elements are of the form x y 0 definitely they are part of R 3, but is the dimension 2 you understand very well from if you close your eyes and look at the geometry the dimension is uh, is the dimension 3 no the dimension is 2. So, here also we are asking the same question is the dimension 4 or less let us see there is an operation called S VEC operation you observe that if I get it get if I make a matrix is if I make a vector by the VEC operation here if I op operate VEC on this matrix symmetric matrix it will give me the it will return me the vector a b b d whose square of the length is you know, normal norm square is a square plus b square plus b square plus d square. So, a square plus 2 b square plus d square this actually motivates us to define a function called s vec symmetric vec operation that is written as a root 2 b d element of R 3. So, those which are appearing twice. So, this early this vector in R 3 this is now a vector in R 3. So, this A B B D corresponds to a vector in R 3 of the same length. So, look at the length of this vector in R 3 a square plus root 2 b whole square plus d square. So, a square plus 2 b square plus d square that is the square of the length. So, what we get is that uh, the length of the symmetry of the when we take a vec operation the vector corresponding to r 4 which is of the form a b b d the length of that vector and this vector in r 3 a root 2 b d are same. So, essentially they are and their directions are same. So, they are representing the same vector you can think even their directions are same basically the basic coordinates have not changed. So, basically there is a scaling of this a b d. So, these these, but they are that that is an R 3 here. So, so I can now safely say or make a guess if you want to say an intuitive guess and later on formalize it. So, we can make an intuitive guess that the dimension of S 2 is 3. So, how do we know that a vector space V is finite dimensional? Is there any way to think about it? A key idea is that of a spanning set. So, idea is that if you have looked into what we did with R 3 in the last lecture R 3 or R 2 that we showed that only with few vectors say 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 we can span the whole of R 3. So, with those 3 vectors we can know this whole infinite space R 3 with uncountably infinite objects. So, we had so, for R 3 we had only 3 elements in the spanning set. 
So, if I can find given a vector space V, if I can find some finite number of elements from that vector space which spans that vector space, then we shall call the vector space finite dimensional. So, obviously when you talk about spanning set vectors, the it has to come from the same vector space, otherwise it has no meaning. So, a spanning set if a vector space V has at least one finite spanning set that is it has it contains only finite number of vectors, then that vec vector is finite dimensional. Now, what it is dimension has other other connotation. So, this is this is the formal definition. So, it is a it is all possible linear combination where this is scalar alpha is are drawn from f which is r or c which is what we have discussed continually telling this fact that it is either r or c. So, if V has a finite vector spanning set at least one, then we will call V finite dimensional. The interesting fact is that once it has one spanning set, there can be many finite dimensional spanning set. So, you see I can always have an infinite uh, uncountable I mean, countably infinite dimensional spanning set. I can just keep on writing some other vectors and put zeros on those vectors, right. So, zeros as coefficients. So, but getting a finite dimensional vector that I, this is this is the maximum number of vectors I need to span the set. I do not need anything more and that is a key issue. See that that is a key idea that the spanning set that once you need only finite number of things to generate that if I need 3 basically it is the length breadth height idea. If I need 4 it is length breadth time idea I mean, you can think in your mind in this way that is a good way to think about it. Now, suppose V is a finite dimensional space with a spanning set V 1, V 2, V n. So, if sorry it should be m here not n m. If V 1, V 2, V m are linearly independent then for any V in the vector space V alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha m uniquely represent V because for, because this is a spanning set V 1, V 2, V m any V can be expressed as a linear as a linear combination of the vectors v1 v2 vm but you can represent them uniquely in this linear combination would be unique only there will be unique set of coefficients for which this happens v would be equal to this uh, provided this v1 v2 vm are also linearly independent so that is alpha 1 alpha m are unique there cannot be two representation there cannot be another set of coordinates beta 1 beta 2 beta m for which you would have the same you can write V as beta 1 V 1 plus beta 2 V 2 plus beta M V M you cannot do that. So, this is kind of interesting. So, we have added one more uh, spice to this independent uh, this spanning set. The spice is that we say are now saying that okay, friends let us just also assume that the elements of the spanning set the vectors that span the vector space V the m vectors are linearly independent then every representation is unique. This uniqueness is a very key idea giving a unique representation that is a key idea because that leads us to give a definition of a basis if you have seen like 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 that actually gives a unique representation in R 3. As any vector x, y, z can be written as x into 0, 0, 1, uh, as, as x into 1, 0, 0 plus y into 0, 1, 0 plus z into 0, 0, 1. There is no other way you can do it. You cannot replace x, x with x minus y or something like that. You cannot do it or x minus 1 or x 1, does not matter. You cannot make any, any other replacement. So, this is very important. So, once you add that spice of linear independence, you can have a formal definition of what is called a basis. A basis of a finite dimensional vector space is a set which not only spans the vector space V, but all the vectors in it are linearly independent. So, as I have written in the last chapters, we have seen through examples that R 3 can have more than one basis. So, basis is nothing but a spanning set which has to be finite because the vector space is finite dimensional and these are linearly independent. Of course, linearly independent means once you want to take a collection of linearly independent vectors obviously that set of vectors has to be finite has to be finite 
there is, we have not defined anything other than that for the definition of linear independence. So, above contents go in for higher dimensional space any any vector space does not matter it may not look like R n for example, m 2 the space of 2 by 2 real matrices they do not look like R, R 4 here there the objects the vectors themselves are matrices pretty abstract in some sense, but R 4 is pretty more more or less you can understand what it is right like uh, symmetric matrices 2 by 2 symmetric matrices are in R 3 you know what a vector in R 3 is you, you can immediately realize what it is, but you will immediately understand unless you had that mapping S vec no way you could have a feeling that those matrix objects are actually looking as a looking like elements in R 3 because they are matrices they do not give you that intuitive feeling that geometrical feeling immediately that is that is the importance of this notion of a vector space that is what linear algebra has done very different looking space, spaces with very different looking elements has an underlying similarity has a connection and that is that is the beauty there is a unifying theme of linear algebra that every n dimensional space in uh, uh, n dimensional vector space must look like R n they may not look but in the sense uh, there has, has some kind of a uh, correspondence with R n they may not look similar to R n, but can be mapped to R n in some way there is a way I can take an one particular element and map it to a unique element of R n. So, that is that is very important. So, this is uh, and that comes out through this basis representation actually if I want to tell you that this alpha 1 to alpha m these are actually called coordinates of the vector v under the chosen basis. So, um, so that is how the once you write down a basis in a finite for a finite dimensional vector space and once you write down the this alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha n for a given v you are this alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha n or m has taken mapped this space v to rm. So, any m dimensional space would be mapped to rm. So, there this whole the once you know the basis you know you have done a mapping. So, there is a so even though they do not look the same there is a structural similarity and you are the so this uh, representation of the vectors is allowing you to do that connection. So, how beautiful is that you you maintain your geometrical vectors intuition all through that even this so called very abstract looking spaces they are essentially geometrical vectors they are they at the end they are putting a different clo clothing like the matrices they are putting up a different looking clothing matrices are actually something called linear operators their functions they are putting a various different clothing hiding themselves or cloaking themselves in up in a different clothing, but in the heart of it it looks like that they are same. As I gave you an example for example, a car like uh, Baleno and Toyota's Glanza. So, they look very different the one is badged as Toyota as told as features driving seats are different panel looks different, but they in their heart they have the same engine going on. So, this is the story of finite dimensional vector spaces that in their heart they are all geometrical vectors that is the idea. Now, you must be worrying that okay, what would happen can there be two bases of the same vector space which has different number of elements, but they are spanning the space and the elements are linearly independent. So, the question is does all bases have the same number of elements then only this definition that we have said which are there in most linear algebra books that the elements number of elements of a basis of a vector space is called the called uh, uh, what is that called the dimension of the space. I think most linear algebra books would casually mention it and then they will go ahead with it, their job, but only Sheldon Axler's book has done a very good job because that is more for mathematicians mathematics students that uh, they actually first try to prove that any once you have defined a basis if the basis if, a, if the space is finite dimensional all the bases will have the same number of elements 
and that will make a sense then that makes a sense then then when you are doing the mapping with r n you what you say that with every changed basis only the coordinates changes of the element elements otherwise all the bases will must have the same number of elements so then the definition that the dimension of a vector space is the number of elements in the basis that makes absolutely clear sense i'm sure you understand this now can a lin set of linearly independent vectors which suppose i am in rn and i have say say r say i am in r3 and i have two linearly independent vectors say 1 0 0 and 0 0 1 they don't span r3 then can it be extended to the basis some can some vectors be added to it and we can extend it to the basis so that that is a key question so these are the two questions that we really need to answer here i have written here that the question one may look foolish but it is not it it, it, it but because unless you prove that the definition of uh, dimension through basis would become meaningless so to do it we will have to prove two lemmas lemma 1 and lemma 2 i think you should write lemma 4.1 i don't know what i have this chapter 4 what i have written of the next lemma it is 4.2 so this lemma would be 4.1 so this lemma 4.1 which will call the linear independent dependence lemma is uh, i have tried to present it as given in axler and then i'll talk about lemma 4.2 of course i don't exactly follow the presentation of axler a lot of the things that i am trying to do with you is what i am trying to say to you as not taken from any book and uh, this I, i found the writing very well very well organized in this book so i said okay maybe maybe i should write follow this for some time so this result will be proved here in this class and then the following result lemma 4.2 is a big result because that is a key result and that would need a lot of work and that would be proved in the discussion hour of the class then we will sit, sit down and then prove this so and then we'll have a discussion mm -hmm. so our class today would end with proving that okay our question number 1 and our second class would be proving the other question so let us see what axler writes very nice book linear algebra done right by sheldon axler i recommend it heavily i think those who are in iit kanpur registered in the course you can go to the library i think the this is a springer undergraduate text in mathematics and you can have a online uh, you can down, download it online because if you go through iit kanpur i think these uh, these are all uh, subscribed so let v1 v2 vm be a set of linearly dependent vectors please understand dependent i all also while writing i am uh, we we use linear independence so much that we forget that sometimes we have to talk about dependent vectors so i had to cancel this so it's linear dependence lemma uh, now but now i feel that cancelling this it look gives us a little message that we are really talking about linear dependence so let v1 v2 vm be a set of linear dependent vectors in the vector space v what we are telling and these vectors uh, so what we are trying to say is that if you have a set of linearly independent de dependent vectors throwing away few vectors may not ch change the span of that set of vectors so if you have v1 v2 vm and and these are linearly dependent and you span is take the span of this set of vectors it could be it would be some subspace of v now what happens is that uh, here what they want to say is that you, you can throw away some vectors which are of particular nature you can uh, throw away some vectors for them but still the span would remain the same so you can reduce the number of vectors which are linearly independent till you come to a situation where you will just have only linearly but you can throw away some vectors you can reduce the number of linearly dependent vectors 
and finally you will come to a position where you cannot throw any of the vectors because they won't be linearly dependent they'll be linearly independent and that would become a basis that's the idea so what it says that you will always be able to find the index j among those m indices 1 to m such that v of j is in the span of the first j minus 1 vectors that is here i have v1 v2 vm so i'm just taking up to j minus 1 if vj is in the span of v1 v2 vj minus 1 if i can find such a vector vj then i can remove that vj from v1 v2 vm i can throw that vj out so now i have now my new set has v1 dot 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 vj minus 1 vj plus 1 dot 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 vm i have thrown the, the vj out but the span of this new list of vectors new set of vectors is same as the span of the older set of vectors v1 v2 vm where vj was there so it means ultimately my span is not disturbed if i throw away vj similarly i can keep on doing this operation in such a way that finally i will not be able to throw away anything so those would be linearly independent and that would be a basis so this is a very very interesting idea actually so what does linear independent means linear independent means that there would be some uh, scalars alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m which could be r or c i am not writing here specifically which is r or c in your mind you can work with r does not matter uh, so even you can think that this whole work is done on r n and not on some v so there such that 0 is equal to alpha 1 plus v 1 plus alpha m v n that is the linear combination is 0 and some of the alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m need not be 0 means all need not be 0 one and only one of them could be 0 a non 0 so now how do you choose that there is a vector like this they will always find a vector which will satisfy this how do you choose this okay the linear in so so once i know about the linear independence i have known that alpha I, I figured out that alpha which will give me this now let j be the largest element such that alpha j is not equal to 0 so all the alphas are not equal all the alphas need not be non zero some can be zero some can be non zero among those so you first feature is alpha 1 0 no, or 0 or non zero okay it is uh, say zero then okay then you say uh, alpha 2 okay non zero alpha 3 non zero and alpha 3 is bigger than alpha 2 but after alpha 3 everything i see is 0 so alpha so j equal to 3 is the index for which alpha j is not equal to 0 that is alpha 3 is not equal to 0 for example ah, so and j is the largest index for which alpha j is not equal to 0 that is l3 in this particular small example that i gave so we will find that j is the largest element such that alpha j is not equal to 0 so any index smaller than j that is j minus 1 j minus 2 3 2 1 the alphas associated with them can be non zero any index i which is strictly bigger than z alpha is zero that is the meaning of choosing the largest elements are that alpha j is not equal to 0 largest index rather I would rather say not element j with the largest index such that alpha j is not equal to 0. So what I do from this equation here alpha j vj is somewhere here I take keep the alpha j vj here and remaining part I take on the left side. So I will write vj alpha j vj is equal to minus alpha on v1 dot 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 minus alpha j1 vj minus 1 you will ask that what about the other remaining part remaining say vj plus 1 to vm uh, j plus 1 j plus 2 to vm because alpha j is associated with them are zeros alpha j plus 1 is 0 alpha j plus 2 is 0 alpha m is 0 because that is the meaning of the this choice 
So, those elements will not come, they are here, but they are all having zeros. So, just forget them. So, only up to j minus 1, ok, there can be some zeros among them also, but all the non zeros are among these. So, because alpha j is non zero, I am dividing by this. It could be that all the alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha j minus 1, all them are all of them are 0. It could be that also that that is v j is 0, because once you have 0 uh, there th that is a uh, you get a kind of uh, you, you get a, a linearly independent set among the you put few vectors and put the 0 vectors you will get a linearly independent, a linearly dependent set. So, I can divide alpha all those things both sides by alpha j to get this equation. So, what do I show here that v j is in the span of v 1, v 2 and v j minus 1 that proves a that yes I can always find an element like this, I can always do so right. Now, what we are going to show that I, okay, now my next step is I have thrown away v j. Now, I am going to span it off, span with this set. So, we will start by assuming u is in the span of v 1 dot dot v 2 v j minus 1 v j plus 1 v m. So, it is a new list where the, this v j is thrown away. So, so if u is in the span of this, u there, there must be scalars b 1 to b j minus 1, b j plus 1 to b m, b j, b j is not appearing here such that u is expressed in this form, this linear combination, this v j is not in the part of the linear combination. But I can always write this as beta 1 v 1 plus instead of v j, I can put 0 into v j. So, basically make it, uh, making u an element with which is formed by the linear combination of elements v 1 to v m with v j also tucked in now. So, u is also in the span of v 1, v 2, v m. So, any element in the span here is also in the span of this. So, the span this span is a subset of the span. The span of the small list is a subset of the span of the bigger list which is obvious actually right. Now, let us do the opposite let u be is in, in the span of v 1, v 2, v m. Okay. Let u be in the span of v 1, v 2, v m. Thus, there exists alpha 1 hat, alpha m hat such that u is like this. Okay. Now, what I will do? I have already figured out what is v j because v j was in the v j I, 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 I know the structure of v j now what v j is. So, I will now put instead of v j I will put the this expression instead of v j I will put this expression and you can immediately till v j minus 1 you can do this manipulations to get u is alpha 1 hat minus alpha 1 by alpha j v 1 till v j minus 1 you have and then after that it is the same alpha at j v j plus 1 it is unchanged. So, what did I prove? I have actually v j is now gone. I have proved that u is in the span of v 1, v 2, v j minus 1, v j, v j plus 1, v m. So, the span of the bigger set, bigger list is in the span of the smaller list. So, basically the span must be equal. So, we have proved the theorem vola. Now, comes to uh, important lemma, the lemma 4.2, which is also taken from Axler, because I have never seen such a beautiful uh, way to do things. May most linear algebra books actually does not give much uh, uh, value to these results, but they are important. Even if you look at Gilbert Strang's book, because he writes largely for engineering and non math students, it gets into completely into the matrix mode and whatever you learn is learned through the matrix mode. So, but I wanted to teach you these things even for economic students because once you know these things when you handle matrices it will be a child's play. You will really enjoy because you know the very fundamentals, you know what to do with them right. So, if v 1, v 2, v m, so I have given you an exercise. So, when I have given you exercise means it is an exercise, it is so it has to be done. So, if v 1, v 2, v m is a linearly independent set of vectors in a vector space v, 
then any subset of v1, v2, vm are also linearly independent. Okay. Now, here is a key result of Axler. So, the exercise tells you that if you throw, um, you take some linear independent vectors, you throw away one, two of them, make a smaller set. That smaller set, those vectors will also be linearly independent. Okay. Now, what does this guy Axler says? He says that you take a linearly independent set of vectors v. And then you take, uh, so you take linearly independent set of vectors v1, v2, vm, the m elements. And then suppose you take a set of vectors w, which has n elements, and such that the span of w, that is the span of w1, w2, wn, gives us the whole vector space v. Then m must be less than n that is the cardinality of those set of linear independent vectors is less than the cardinality of w. If I give you a set of linear independent vectors and a set of spanning vectors, the spanning vectors the cardinality the, the number of linear independent vectors must be less than or equal to the spanning vectors when they are equal then they are the spanning vector forms a basis basically and if they are linearly independent. So, please understand the space of uh, this is a very, very important result. So, if I have a given a vector, finite dimensional vector space, if I have some, if I have a set of linearly independent vectors and also I am given a set of span, spanning vectors of the vector space, then this list of spanning vectors always has more elements than the list of independent, uh, this linearly independent vectors. Of course, the vectors will, may look very, very different, right. But they have the they they that their numbers the, the number of linearly independent vectors the cardinality of b is always less than the cardinality of w. This is very very important. It doesn't matter if you change this with some other spanning set, which which instead of w one it, it it is some say um, say q one q two q one. Then also the same result will hold. Doesn't matter. It is the number of element that is important in the spanning set and the linearly independent set. The number of elements in the linearly independent set of a vector space will always be less than the number of elements in a spanning set. This is a key idea. We will not prove this result, but this result will immediately lead us to this extremely important result of linear algebra, a fundamental result. Let it give me any finite dimensional vector space. I am not writing when I write a given vector space, I am just meaning a finite dimensional vector space because this chapter is on finite dimensional vector space. There is nothing more about it. So, for any given vector space V, any two basis sets or a set of basis vectors, whichever you want to call, have the same cardinality. They must have the same number of elements. The number, the elements may not be same, but the number is same. Right, like for example, 0, 1, 1, 0 is a basis vector which is called the canonical basis vector of R2. But say 1, 0, 1, 1, this is also a basis vector. They are not the same set, but their number of elements remain the same. So, let us see how do we will prove this result, and that is an application of just the lemma 4.2 which we just we had. Now, top suppose b1 and b2 are two basis sets of v which means b1 is spanning v and linearly independent has all elements linearly independent and b2 is a spanning v and also has all elements linearly independent now consider b1 as the set of linearly independent set and consider b2 as the spanning set then by lemma 4.2 the cardinality of b1 the number of elements in b1 must be less than equal to cardinality of b2. Now, by a similar argument switch the roles of b1 and b2. Now, make b2 the linearly independent set because it is anywhere basis and make b1 the spanning set. So, then cardinality of b2 by lemma 4.2 must be less than cardinality of b1 and combining these two we get cardinality of b1 
must be cardinality of B2 vola and this is the key result that we need to know and once this is done you know this definition of dimension makes absolute sense and this is what is there for this class friends and we will tell some more stories in the next class and then move on to in part 2 of this chapter 4 uh, which will be essentially uh, chapter 4 on lecture 4 part 2 which will be linear uh, linear maps and then uh, a lot of matrices will start having their importance they will start play, uh, playing the main role finally. So, thank you have a nice evening.